With degrees in criminal justice and ethics, over 30 years of investigative experience, a recognized expert in investigation procedures, and an expert in criminal and social behaviors, I am Rick Decker, and this is A Shadow of Truth. Greetings from sunny Charleston, South Carolina. So today we are talking about the Black Widow Granny, Betty Newmar. Betty was quite a piece of work. She had been married, married five times. But it wasn't until she killed her fourth husband that somebody took notice. And as we all know, snitches get stitches, but not in Betty's case, because that turned out to be the thing that lit the fire underneath everybody's ass. Before we get too far gone into the show, I want to thank you for listening. You can reach out to the show at a shadow of truth podcast at gmail.com. Also, please don't forget to like and share the show on your selected platform. So let's get back into what we were talking about. So as I was talking about a snitch, Betty had killed her husband, Harold, and the brother-in-law had taken notice that there was something wrong in that marriage and in that relationship. And he contacted law enforcement to try to get law enforcement to investigate Betty. And they really didn't pay any attention to him. In fact, it took him 21 to 22 years to get law enforcement's attention. All along, Betty went out and lived her life. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I got to tell you, keeping an eye out for your neighbor, usually a good thing. But nevertheless, Betty had a total of five husbands, all of them who died. Now, what got the attention of someone on the murder of Harold was it was a hit. She tried to have somebody pay him, uh, pay to kill him. And that guy turned out to be uh, a retired police officer. And as anyone can guess, that obviously didn't go well. It's still unknown today who actually murdered Harold, and that case is still open. Betty's acts will probably go down in history as one of the most frustrating cases of all times. It seems that she was always one step ahead of the law, and from a criminal defense side, one could say that she probably should be classified or labeled as a serial killer because, in her case, that never came to trial, and she was never officially convicted, and it was an adjudicator, but and she wasn't able to stand trial. However, even in today's society, she is probably the the luckiest or smartest serial killer we've ever seen. Um, she escaped responsibility here in this life, but the evidence does outline her life of violence. And the worst thing about all this is that she leaves behind carnage of collateral victims. Betty was born in 1931 in Ohio to Otis and Elizabeth Johnson. Her education was normal. She matriculated from South Point High School, and that was about it as far as what we know about her life. And the reason for that is like I I mentioned before, is that this investigation was just getting going. People were starting to dig into this, and within a few years, she died. So as I mentioned before, Al, who is Betty's ex-brother-in-law, raised alarms to the police when Thomas was found dead in the couple's home, having been shot multiple times. And even with that type of evidence, it took the brother, like I said, 20-some years to get the attention of the police to look deeper into 
his brother's murders. And that wasn't even enough for the police at that time to dig into this because I guess there might have been some unrest in the family, as one could say. But eventually, the police arrested Betty, Betty and that's when the egg really broke open. During the investigation, which was sometimes sometime after Mr. Gentry's death, that um, they discovered that she had been married not just one, but five times. And each of her spouses were dead. Clarence Malone was the first. He married her and then was able to divorce her. However, he they remarried and he was later found dead, uh, allegedly shot by another individual. And now the funny thing is, or the odd thing is, is that Newman, John Newman, her last victim, had told people in public that Gentry was found shot in a truck and froze after his death. I mean, the stories were up and down about what had happened to her previous husbands by the time she got to John, who was number five. And then next we have James Flynn. Mr. Flynn was murdered on a pier in New York, and her third husband was Richard Seals. It was reported that he died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound during an argument with Betty behind closed doors. This murder happened in Florida. Now, the thing to remember here is that Mr. Sills was a Navy man, and she not only had to answer to local authorities, but to the Navy. And there was a series of just error upon error made in each of these investigations, which in my mind has culminated into the disaster of of what we see today and read about. It's just the right hand didn't know what the left hand was doing at any given time. And I think in terms of when we talk about how killers make a mistake, Betty's mistake was that she forgot that she had her ex-brother-in-law floating behind her and that when she murdered John, or allegedly murdered John Newman, um, his death, death was originally ruled natural causes related to sepsis, ischemic bowel, and ileitis, all of which could point to not natural causes but arsenic poisoning now we talk about a lot on the show and about taking care of one another and i have my reasons for that and it's because we never know where evil lurks john's son john jr told police that john owned a burial plot and had planned on using that plus he didn't find out about his dad's death until he read about it in the local newspaper. Now, to the normal person, not notifying family of the passing of a loved one is is pretty odd. And to find out that the only way people knew was reading about it in the newspaper, it speaks for itself. You know, every day we all hear stories about somebody or something, you know. And from the outside, it doesn't seem suspicious. But when you're on the inside and you can start stacking up a history of similarities between the ending of relationships or the the ending of whatever, the regeneration, restart of a new thing, when you look at the whole picture, then it, starts coming up to the surface about what's really going on. The problem is, is that stories are told and they're passed and passed and people just take them with a grain of salt and stories were told between the ex or dead husbands, I guess I should really say that were just considered a part of life. 
you know, that so-and-so, her first husband was shot, her second husband murdered somewhere else, you know, yada, you know, it just, it goes on. And we have to pay attention in our world to the stories that we hear because inside the stories is a glimmer of truth. So when John or whoever else started talking about Betty's late husbands, it should have, in my mind, tripped off an alarm bell to somebody that something wasn't right, and for whatever reason, it didn't. This investigation took decades to start, and it was covering multiple states, an unsurmountable amount of witnesses and timelines that had to be brought together from 22 to 24 years earlier to present, which is really hard to do. On cases like this, you know, people get lost, evidence gets confused or forgotten, witnesses are more difficult to find if we're able to find them at all. The key players in all this was an ex-son-in-law or in-law, brother-in-law, a son that didn't want to let this woman push him aside and get away with anything, and then another son, the son to the late Richard Sills. Richard, like I said, was Navy, and at the time of Mr. Sills' death, he was recovered by the Navy and because he was active military, and the son asked for the Navy NCIS to take another look at his father's death. Well, they did. And when they looked at the medical examiner's report, it was discovered that Mr. Sill suffered from two gunshot wounds, one to the heart and one to the liver. Now, don't know how many of you have been out in the street working as paramedics. I have. One gunshot wound to the heart pretty much does it. People don't really shoot themselves a second time. So Mr. Sill got the Navy and the state of Florida back involved, and they had all agreed that they were going to exhume Mr. Sill's body. Now, for whatever reason, I, mean, I just don't understand it, but the state said, oh, well, we can't exhume it because the statute of limitation applies. I never heard of any statute of limitation applicable to a murder case and applicable to not exhuming a body. Now, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, but that's the most ass nine damn thing I've ever heard that, oh, well, sorry, Think he may have been shot twice, murdered, but we're not going to dig the body up to find out. So the body was never exhumed. The Navy did plan on investigating Mr. Sill's death further, but like everything else in this story and every other part of every part of the case in this story, when Betty died, that ended it for everyone, almost. So you see, Betty's motive was clear. She was trying to collect insurance money on John's death. You know, I'm assuming that's what the situation was on the other deaths. The gunmen's were never identified, so that it can lead one to the conclusion that since Betty couldn't hire the gunman, she was the gunman. And once she did it herself and was able to get away for, with it, she saw how easy it was to do. I believe Betty was a clear narcissistic personality with antisocial behaviors that took full advantage of having access to her victims. They were attracted to her and she was attracted to them. And she was able to control their vulnerability and use that to her advantage. Motivation for Betty could have been money. It could have been control over another human being. The truth is, we're never really going to know. 
It could have been thrilled that, oh, I got away with this once, I can get away with it again, and just to see if they could repeat it. The world will never know. See, at Betty's death, it ended all the investigations. However, it didn't end it for the collateral, the collateral victims, the families that were left behind. They're never going to know the why. Why she did it, why did it in this way, why did you pick on my family? The list of whys is always lengthy. And the children of John, Richard, and the brother to Harold, they all deserve justice. They all deserve to hear those answers. And now because of time and circumstances, investigations like this take a long time to do. And I guess you could say Betty had the most perfect timing. She died of unknown causes. And that uh, too, in and of itself is a mystery. It is being looked at. We can't blame law enforcement. We can't blame anyone except the actor. Investigations like this take time. Fo protocols have to be followed. The unfortunate truth is sometimes we're just not meant to know or meant to understand the things that happens in our lives. When we're doing an investigation, we're always running against the clock. We're running against the clock of looking for another victim against the clock for if the suspect passes away against the clock on evidence. We're running against the clock on everything and every aspect of an investigation of all time. And sometimes we lose. And even when we win, people lose. Well, that's the show for today. I want to thank you for listening. I know this one is a short show. I apologize. Um, truth be told, I'm sitting here with the flu and can, can barely talk. But I'm glad you enjoy the show. Uh, we'll be back next week. Until next time, please, let's take care of one another. Carpe diem.